I know you're going to ask. Pastor said, how do we get happiness? Where does it come from? You're going to tell me the answer, right? It's Jesus. We're in church. Have you ever heard your parents tell you, don't let your friends' bad habits rub off on you? Maybe you've even told it to your kids. Maybe you're worried about who your kids are going to hang out with or something like that. But there's truth in it, isn't there? Sometimes when you're hanging out with friends, their bad habits can rub off on you. But did you know that good habits can also rub off on kids as well? Not only do the bad ones, but the good ones. So we always try and tell our kids to hang out with good people, good friends, right? So today we're going to read Psalm chapter number one. And we're going to look at the very beginning in the book of Psalms. We're going to see Jesus again in the midst of it. And if we're living with him every day, we should end up being like him. We should have the, rub ha the good habits rub off on us. There's this book, it's called In His Steps, and it's by Charles Sheldon. And here's the question he asked. It's what happened in youth groups all across the world in the 1990s. They even made a bracelet that said it. What would Jesus do? And we've heard it time and time again. And in this book, uh, it, it talks about how do we emulate Christ in our lives? What would Jesus do in this particular situation? If you're hanging out with bad friends and something happens, well, what would Jesus do in that situation? Same with the good things that happen. What would Jesus do in those particular situations? So Psalm 1 is going to tackle a lot of this question that we have in what would Jesus do? So we're going to start in Psalm chapter 1. We're going to read the whole chapter. It's only six verses. Verse number one. Blessed is the one who does not walk in, the, in step with the wicked, or stand in the way that sinners take, or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. Not so the wicked. They are like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in judgment, nor sinners in the assemblies of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction. So there are two themes in chapter 1. In verse 1, two themes that happen in this whole thing. That of a person with bad habits and that of a person with good habits. And what we see in this whole chapter is what would Jesus do? How would he figure out all of this stuff? So the righteous man is called blessed, right? We read that in our English as blessed, which it references this redemptive presence of God. And so this, this psalm, it foreshadows this perfectly blessed man, the man who is blessed beyond all measure, something that we will never be able to attain, and that's Jesus Christ, right? So we're supposed to emulate him. So blessed also in the Hebrew is called, I'm going to try and say this, but I'm going to butcher it. Here's the Hebrew word, it's ashray, okay? Ashray means happy, so the whole, all of the Psalms, the beginning of the Psalms, the very first word that comes into the whole book of Psalms is happy. We are supposed to be happy, right? But how do we do that and maintain it, right? There's another way you can translate that very first part. It, it, you can also say that it is blessed is the one, capital O, Blessed is the one, which may be a better translation 
at Psalm 1 is not merely about humanity in general, but it's about a particular person that we're supposed to emulate. But it is not only about us, it's also about the Son of Man. So when we're supposed to emulate this person, Jesus Christ, we got to take a look at all these six verses. So Psalm 1, it tells of this man. His name's Jesus Christ, right? He's blessed. But Psalm 2, it tells us that all those who put their trust in him are blessed or happy. We see this all in the New Testament. Those who trust in Jesus are now in Christ, within him, the chosen one. We talked about that last week, right? And so we are blessed in Christ. In Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3, it makes it clear that we've been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, right? So if this psalm tells us how Christ is blessed, the next psalm tells us that those who trust in Christ are blessed in him. So let me ask you a question. Can you truly be happy in life? Can you actually 100% truly be happy in life? Let me ask another question. Are you happy right now? I've talked to many people, talked to a lot of people who volunteer a lot in the church. I've talked to a lot of people outside of church. And I could tell you, most of them will say, I'm not sure if I'm ever 100% totally happy all the time. How is that possible, right? Because our lives are like hills and valleys, right? Happy, not so happy. Happy, not so happy. Really, 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 really happy? really, really bummed, right? It's all a part of life. Let me ask you a question, though, before we go on. I want to change the question a little bit and ask it this way. If life didn't change at all right now, right now in your current life, from this moment forward, the situation that you're in, it doesn't move. Your marital status that you're in, it doesn't change. Your situation that is going on in your life, it, your career didn't progress. You didn't get anything else in life except for what you currently have just right now. Would you be happy? Now, here's what I know you're going to ask. Pastor said, how do we get happiness? Where does it come from? You're going to tell me the answer, right? It's Jesus. We're in church, right? You know what? A Sunday school teacher, she tricked her kids, and here's what she said. Here's what she said. She asked the, uh, a group of first graders, she said, what is gray, has four paws, a bushy tail, and eats acorns? A squirrel, right? One of the little boys raises his hands, though, and says, it sounds like a squirrel, but we're in Sunday school. So the answer is always supposed to be <laughs> Jesus. It's got to be Jesus, right? Now, I know you're going to think that I'm going to say Jesus is the point. Jesus is the way that we're all going to get happy in life, and that's it, right? You think that, but there's so much more in this psalm than just Jesus. And I say that lightly by saying just Jesus, because Jesus is the one who saved us all. Here's what we see in this psalm. More than Jesus. Beyond Jesus, if you will. Here's the first thing. You won't be happy when your happiness is based on your circumstances. The psalmist, he assumes that life is going to go through seasons. Here in Illinois, we can have four seasons in one week. Sometimes we can have four seasons in one day. We understand seasons. Summer, fall, here comes fall, right? The leaves are starting to turn. It's beautiful out, right? But it gets cold. I don't like cold. Then you get winter. 
winter happens, and then it gets really, really cold, right? And then we go back over to spring, there's growing season, and then back into summer. We understand all of this stuff, right? So the spring and summer seasons are where the environment is pretty good, right? Then you got the winter seasons that sometimes try to kill you, right? Then you got droughts. They're going to try and starve you where there's no rain or nothing at all, right? You can cut out the drought. You can cut out the winter seasons from your life. But if your happiness is dependent on a particular season and you only want spring and summer, your happiness is going to be truly off. You're not going to understand the other parts of life. You know, I've heard that when you're young, when you're in your younger years and your teens, you think happiness is inevitable. You think it's going to happen, right? Because everybody tells you it. You're going to be happy. You're going to find that special, that special someone in your life. And you're going to go and get married. And you're going to have a great life, right? You're going to get that great job right out of college. Ha! <laughs> liars. You're all liars. And if you'll be patient, but if you'll be patient, if you just wait a little bit longer, just a small more, just a little bit more, you're going to be happy. It's going to happen. So then you get to a certain age. I'm starting to hit that certain age. And this whole happiness is inevitable thing turns into happiness is unattainable. I will never be able to be 100% happy all the time. You can't do it. You can have the great house. You can have the perfect car. You can have the wonderful, most amazing, beautiful, perfect wife in the whole world, which I do have. <laughs> but let me tell you, I'll buy you lunch, I promise. <laughs> but let me tell you something. None of that is going to make you happy all the time. It won't. It's not going to work. You know, here's what, so here's what I did. I wanted to figure out how am I going to attain happiness in life? How am I going to figure it out? What is, what is the way that the world is going to tell me how to get happiness? Well, let me tell you, I went to the most important, most intellectual place on the planet. I searched the internet. Because <laughs> it's got all the answers, right? Here are the top eight ways that the internet tells you that you could be happy. I'm going to tell them, I'm going to try and go a little quick because there's eight of them. Be optimistic. That's the first thing they tell you to do. Just be optimistic about your life. Let me tell you, what about if your life is a mess? What if it's a hot mess? What if there isn't any promise that it's going to change? What if nothing happens? Let's just ignore it all and we'll just try and be optimistic about life and it'll be great. That's what it tells us. Here's the second one. Follow your gut. Follow your gut instincts, right? Your gut doesn't lie, amen? Your no, it doesn't, don't say amen to that, all right? The Bible says that your heart is deceitful. Your heart will lie to you above all else. So don't do that. Don't follow your gut. Number, number three, this, this is one of my favorite ones. Own yourself. Own yourself. This is the self-love movement is what I call it. Let's just love who we are and ignore all of the bad faults that happen in our lives because we're all so perfect and everybody's got it all figured out. I don't want you to tell me what's wrong with myself. I just want you to love me. Are, no, are you kidding me? Let's grow and learn and mature. Oh, here's number four. Let's make enough money to make our own basic needs meet. Money solves, the, it's, it solves all our problems, doesn't it? You can't make enough money, right? What if you lose your job? What if your car breaks down? What if you got all these bills you need to pay and you just can't, you don't know what to do? Number five, treat your body like it deserves to be happy. So let's all eat and get really fat and let's not be healthy at all. And that, that's going to solve all of our problems too. All right. So we're, we're, and we're optimistic about that too. That's rule number one, because we're all unhealthy too. All right. Number six, stay close to family and friends. Are all of your family members really nice to you? <laughs> what about all your friends? 
Are all your friends really nice to you? You don't know what they say at the dinner table when you're not there. <laughs> all right? All right? Family and friends, they are, might be good people, but they're going to fail. They're going to fail because we're human beings, and that's what happens. Number seven, have a deep, meaningful conversation for somebody. Can I tell you something as an introvert? That scares me a lot to have a meaningful conversation, right? If you are not a good per, a person who can just openly speak about your life and tell you how it's going, if you are a depressed person, if you have anxiety or something like that, you really don't want to talk to people, right? You just want to sit in your home in a corner in the dark and eat ice cream. And above all else, if the top seven ones don't work, here's the eighth way to make you happy. Just smile. <laughs> just smile. Let's just cover up one through seven. Nothing else is working. And let's just smile about it because that's fun, right? Uh, my whole life is in peril, but I'm just going to smile I'm just going to put on my face. How are you doing? I'm great. Nothing's wrong. It's okay, right? All wrong answers, right? Let's not do any of those. So let's figure it out here. So it's not based on our, it's based on our, circum, not based on our circumstances to be happy. Here's the second thing. You won't be happy when you have no anchor point outside of your health, outside of yourself. A happy man, verses 4 and 5, remember, here's what Scripture says. The happy man is like a tree with deep roots anchoring him. This attacks one of the myths that we just talked about, that the belief that happiness comes from complete freedom, from complete freedom from everything else. You'll be happy when you answer to no one, when you think you're the latest and greatest, and you're the best. When you're free to make your own rules, when you're free to define your own meaning, when you're free like a room without a roof, right? You have everything and you're just going to do it all. That is not going to work if you do not have an anchor point outside of yourself. If your life has no anchor point, you're like what? Scripture tells us you're like chaff. Chaff is just this dusty stuff that comes from wheat and it blows away. It blows away in the wind and it goes and you will never see it again. In my backyard, I have got four giant oak trees. They're big. I really want to cut them down because they're above our house. But they are big. And the root systems that are underneath those things go so far down, you would not be able to pull the root out of the ground in order to get the tree out. What would you have to do? You got to climb up to the tree and cut it down limb by limb by limb by limb till you get to the, the stump and then you call a company to grind the stump up and then it's gone, right? This root system is what we need in our lives. We need a root system that can't be moved. We need a root system that is just impenetrable to all things. Even if somebody comes up and clips one of the limbs off of our tree, we have many more limbs that will grow and our root system will continue to produce new limbs. Amen? Over and over and over and over. And this tree will just keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And so God tells us through scripture, he says, you need a rooted system in your life. Something that will not fail. Something that will not go wrong. And so the psalmist, he says that if you don't have this root system in verse 5, the ungodly will not survive the judgment. So not only is life here meaningless when we have nothing, when we have no root system out of this stuff, even worse, at the end, you're going to stand in judgment. So here's what's going to happen. Bible and the scripture tells us that at the appointed time, unto man wants to die, and after that, to judgment. We will stand face to face in heaven and face our own judgment. And God's going to say, do you believe me? Do you believe in who I am? And we're going to say, yes or no. And he's going to say, do you really believe in who I am? What's your root system look like? Do you have an anchor? Are you really rooted down in me? And he's either going to say, yes or no. 
Jesus, he even asked this question. He, tell, he tells all of the people, he says, uh, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose your soul? What's the point in all of that? What, what accomplishments are we going to gain? What accomplishments are we going to trade for our very own soul in life? What earthly dream will you say was worth forfeiting your only soul for eternity? How happy are you going to be with said goal? Whatever the goal is, you're just going to want another goal to be happy, right? It's the endless cycle of life. Let's get happy here. We're done with that happiness. Let's move on to this happiness. We're here, there, and then we're happy. You're seeing it all over the place in marriages right now. Two out of three, they used to say one out of three marriages end in divorce. Now they're saying two out of three end in divorce, we're almost up to 75% going even further where three out of four marriages are failing. Why? They're not happy. They're not happy. They're trying to attain a goal that they can't meet. Can I tell you something? I'm not perfect. I, I, I'm not a perfect husband. I don't have it all figured out as a husband, and I'm just glad that my wife stays with me. I don't have it all figured out. I don't know how to be the perfect husband. I, I, I don't know how to make her 100% happy all the time. And she doesn't for me. But that's okay as long as we understand where happiness comes from. Right? Happiness comes from the Sunday school answer. In Jesus Christ. Through the word. Through our church members. We're, we're going to talk about all of this in just a minute. So he does one other thing in this psalm that I want to take a minute to show you. But... Uh, I, I want to I talk about this for a minute. And here's where our happiness is going to come to a conclusion, right? It's not enough to simply say, I am a Christian. It's not enough to simply say, let's try out Jesus and see what happens. It's not simply enough to say, let's just go to church on Sunday. Are all of those great things to do? Yes, absolutely. But in and of itself, it does not accomplish the goal. Go back to verse 1. Go back to verse 1. Here's where it is. Blessed or happy is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. That's counsel, right? He's talking about the way that we think. Here's our mind. Nor stand in the way of sinners. The way of sinners, that's a reference to how you behave when you're not here or even in here. How do you behave? How do you act around people? Nor sit at the seat of scoffers. And this is when we got to look a little deeper. So in Jewish culture, where you sat showed where you belong. So if you were a, a young person, you would sit with young people. Men sat with men. The old with the old. The rich with the rich. It was a standing of who you are. And so what he's saying is you, I want you to let your mind, to let your behaviors, and to let your identity, who you are as a person, be shaped around one thing. And it's the next thing that he talks about in verse 1. You need to have all of your identity, everything that you are, be shaped around the Word of God. And that's it. All we have to do, and I've been saying it for a while, is open that book up and read it. Just read it. Look at the words and see what it says. How do we act? How should we act? How should we pray? How should we eat? How should we treat our children? How should we do all of these other different things? It's all in the word of God. So it's not enough to just come to church. It's not enough just to say, I want to be a Christian, or even I just want to be saved. Of course I want you to be saved and understand salvation, but it's more than that. That's the beginning, right? So your thinking, your actions, your identity are all shaped by the gospel. The gospel must become your anchor. It is your root system in life. It has all of the answers that you get asked on a daily basis. It's all right there. The information is for you for the taking. All you got to do is, is read it. And so because it becomes our anchor, whether the winters happen and we're lonely at times, whether we go through a drought of depression, whether there's storms where we get tempted by things in our life and the sin that just encircles us on a daily basis, your soul will remain steadfast because of the word of God. 
So the secret to happiness, it's your root system. It's driving it down deep. It's making a big ball of roots. It's continuing to grow. And in light of that, there's another thing that we need to do as well. Because we read the the word of God, we all have a commonality, and that's Jesus Christ. And that's where the church comes into play. You see, this sermon might inspire you today. You might go home and think, wow, that was a great sermon. So glad the pastor preached it. But do you know what I preached eight weeks ago? Nope. (laughs) Now we have have the internet. See, sermons might inspire you for a minute. But the people that are sitting in the pews next to you, the people that are sitting next to you at home, the community that surrounds you right now, they shape you you. They not only shape you today on Sundays, they shape you tomorrow when you need something or you just want to hang out. And the day after that, when you want to have supper together. And the day after that, when you need a phone call because you're lonely. Whatever it might be, the community around us shapes you. You see, here's what I want you to know. The friends that you hang out with are your future you. They shape you. If you want to know what you'll be like in the future, look at your friends in the present. Your friends are your future you. They are who you are. Parents, your kids, your kids' friends are the future them. How they hang out with them, who they hang out with them, what they do, where they go, all of the different things, they are shaping them. They are the future them. And so hearing a a once-a-week sermon, a a once-a-week pep talk, it's not going to make a difference for them spiritually. It's when the church and the people of God come together in community. It's why we're having an awesome, busy, amazing October month. We are going to be here all the time. We're going to have opportunity to, to fellowship with one another, to talk about missions, to talk about friendship, to hand out candy to people uh, for, for the trunk or treat. We're, we're going to be here for a bonfire on Saturday night out at Mr. Jerry's house. We're going to have our bonfire. We've got all of these different opportunities to just sit and talk and hang out and eat food. It's the reason why we church. The church should not be an event that you attend occasionally on the weekend. It should be your community. It should be who you are and how you hang out. Your best and your deepest relationships should be here. So here's what Douglas Webster writes. He's a commentator. He says, The meaning and fulfillment of the human person is bound up with the meaning and person of the Son of Man, who came not to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. We could not reach for righteousness if Christ were not first a righteous man. We could not delight in the word of God and read the Bible if Christ himself did not delight in the word of God. Our habits and our actions as Christians should follow Jesus' example And all of it is right there. Psalm chapter 1. Would you pray with me, please? So, Father, we continue to lift up your word. And we pray, Father, that it may be firmly rooted, firmly rooted in our soul, Father. I pray that we can stop living a gut instinct kind of life, Father, and live a life that is spirit-filled with you that we might be able to learn and listen and love how you have taught us to be. Father, I pray that we can surround ourselves every single day with good influences in our life, that we might be able to build each other up, to, Father, make us happy with one another, to share our hopes, to share our lives with each other, and to be joy-filled throughout the entire process. And I pray, Father, that through even the darkest seasons, even through the the wintry weather seasons, through the droughts and through the storms, 
Father, that your family, that your group of people that you put around us can lift and build each other up every single day. We love you so much, and we thank you for your son. And it's in his name that we pray all of these things. Amen.